Okay. Thanks. If you're not as smart as the other speakers, you should try and dress better than them. So I always wear a good suit. Um, we have a health system that doesn't care about nutrition and a food system that doesn't care about health. In a nutshell, I think that's our problem. Um, there'll be an exam at the end. <laughs> the title of this slide is Simplified Version of Insulin Action. So here's what I think is going on. We have this big epidemic. And it's actually a single epidemic. It's not different epidemics. It's the epidemic of overweight and obesity, metabolic syndrome. Think of that as prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. These things are all part of the same disease process. We have a single epidemic. And the thing that ties these together, the epidemic, is insulin resistance. I'm not the first one who thought of that. Paul Zimmet is a leading diabetologist. He's based in Melbourne, Australia. He's a f funny guy. He kind of he kind of tolerates me. Um, he wrote a paper about this a while ago, and this is 2000, so 14 years ago now, in which he said type 2 diabetes is the tip of the iceberg. The iceberg is metabolic syndrome, and that's a combination of factors: uh, insulin resistance, high insulin, central obesity, fat fat around the middle, uh, lipid problems and high blood pressure. And I add a bigger iceberg under that one, and that's the obesity epidemic. So this, think of this as a continuum. Obesity, prediabetes, diabetes, and heart disease. We also know now from a lot of observational work that other things cluster around insulin resistance. So that if you have insulin resistance, if you're anywhere on that pathway of obesity, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, which is worsening insulin resistance, you also are at greater risk for a number of other very chronic, very common conditions. Fatty liver, we used to think when I trained, fatty liver was because you drank too much alcohol. Now we have an epidemic of fatty liver in people who don't drink. It's because of insulin resistance. Small dense LDL, that's the bad cholesterol that's, that is associated with cardiovascular disease risk. Oxidative stress, think of that as free radicals. Your free radical output's too high. Inflammation, hypercoagulability, that's why a lot of you are taking little aspirins. Uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, that's a female manifestation of insulin resistance. Gastroesophageal reflux, acid reflux, sleep apnea, asthma, depression, osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, a number of cancers. Now, we all associate with higher levels of insulin resistance. Did you hear that beep? That's my wife texting me a picture of her skiing at Whistler <laughs> right now. Beautiful sunny day. That's where I was supposed to be today. Um, so metabolic syndrome was uh, first described by Gerald Reven in the mid-1990s. And he was looking at, he called it syndrome X. So it sounds more ominous, doesn't it? Um, and he was, talk he was looking at a cluster, a cluster of things that all seemed to appear together and that predisposed you to diabetes and cardiovascular disease. But he also noticed early on that insulin-mediated glucose disposal, in other words, insulin resistance, was the basic defect, the thing that was underlying this metabolic syndrome, and that dietary carbohydrate is increased in an isochloric diet. Additional insulin must be screened to maintain glucose homeostasis. So he's already linking dietary carbohydrate to metabolic syndrome. And then interestingly, as his idea gained acceptance and prominence and he rose in stature in the research world, he kind of put, forgot about the carbohydrate component. His later work, uh, that kind of disappeared from the discussion. This is, this is a paper published a few years ago that characterizes the development and the progression of type 2 diabetes. So in the bottom here, you're looking at years, a timeline in years, and that zero year that point in time is when you get your diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. And what they're talking about in this paper is if you went back in time, in this case 12 years, and if you looked really hard, you would detect the early signs of insulin resistance, something we don't really do. We wait until you develop, you lose control of your blood sugar, and then we diagnose your diabetes. But the point here is that insulin resistance starts years in advance of uh, the d diagnosis of diabetes. And it starts very quietly and silently. You don't really notice what's going on. But you're 
your ability to produce insulin starts to decline as soon as you develop insulin resistance. And that's what this dotted line is. You're losing your capacity to, to produce insulin. Early in your insulin resistance, you produce excess insulin to overcome the insulin resistance. And eventually, your capacity to do that declines to the point where you can no longer control your blood sugar, and that's when you get your diagnosis. And then we treat you with these the yellow dots represent drugs and insulin and so on. But that underlying disease process does not stop. It continues on. And you worsen your beta cell function, and your underlying pathology actually gets worse, not better. So really, the conventional approach here is to treat the symptoms and not the underlying cause. And here's how we treat metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes. We, use, we fill a shotgun full of drugs, and we blast away. These, these are the different classes of drugs. There's multiple drugs in some of these classes. And there are 20 classes of drugs here. So let's, let's look at the progression of this epidemic. And we have, th thanks to your CDC in Atlanta, some good data on the progression of the obesity epidemic. So think of this as the leading edge of the insulin resistance epidemic. And you've probably seen these slides if you saw Supersize Me, or I think there's been other places where these slides have been shown. And what you're seeing here is the advancing rates of obesity across the American states. And so that darker blue is obesity rates of 10 to 14 percent. The lighter uh, blue is obesity rates under 10 percent. And you can see things getting worse over time. We now have a new category of 15 to 19 percent. And watch as that spreads across the states. And then we have to add another category of more than 20%. And then that spreads from year to year. And then we have to add another category of more than 25%. And that keeps spreading. From, and, and the other thing that's interesting, and I'm, I'm an outside, I'm a Canadian. I, I'm not involved in your politics. But aren't, aren't those the states that elected George Bush, the, the ones that are? <laughs> leading the epidemic here. Anyway, carry on. This, uh, that we now added a new category of over 30%, and that's spreading across the states as well. So we have this fascinating phenomenon of a chronic disease epidemic occurring in recent memory, starting and spreading across a continent. Uh, Eric gave me this slide. It's a different way of looking at that data. This is uh, 71, uh, the early 70s, mid to late 70s, and so on. And you can see the obesity curve is pretty flat up till that point, and then it takes off. So that epidemic started somewhere in this time. So if you know when something started, you should be able to figure out what caused it to start, right? Something had to happen here to make that happen. Here's the diabetes curve in the US. And you can see a same, the same kind of rise in rates. This started around 1990-92, about 12 years after the obesity curve took off. So think of that earlier slide where the, the, the uh, uh, insulin resistance took 12 years to manifest as type 2 diabetes. There's a lag between these different stages of insulin resistance uh, uh, epidemics. So that fits nicely with that uh, earlier one that I showed you. So why? What caused this? Why is this happening? Well, we're very lucky because the best minds in the world have put their head together and they all agree on what caused this. Eating too much and exercising too little makes you get fat. And when you get fat, you develop metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or both. Pretty simple, right? Everybody agrees, WHO, Overweight is an energy imbalance, calories we consume and calories we, we, we expend. S CDC, uh, same thing. It's all about balancing the number of calories. The United Kingdom, medical research, it's simple imbalance between energy in and energy out. Everywhere you go, they all agree, it's simply because people suddenly start eating more and exercising less. I have a bridge to sell you, if you believe that. And so, based on that, simple uh, understanding of what the cause of the problem is, we based our prevention programs on that concept. So we told people to exercise more, uh, eat less, uh, more exercise, uh, get rid of the junk food, more exercise, 
And what, what happened after investing you know, all our efforts and billions of dollars in this prevention effort, we went from there to there to there at the same time. So we could pretty much sum up our success in prevention with this t-shirt. <laughs> Any reasonable objective look at this would tell us that we failed, okay? And in the normal course of events, when you try something and you try as hard as you can for many years and it fails, you go back to your fundamentals and say, did we get, did we get the analysis right? Was our concept right? But for some reason, when it comes to this, there's real resistance in doing that. Nobody wants to believe that we didn't get it right. They want to flog, keep flogging that dead horse to make it get up and run. So let's pick this apart a little bit. Exercise. It makes sense if you exercise and burn off calories that you should be able to reduce your weight and improve these problems. Well, as it turns out, that's not true. Eric's already talked about it, so I won't spend too much time, but uh, Jim Hill's at Colorado. He's a big leading proponent of this idea that you eat one less cookie a day or you run up one extra flight of stairs a day and it's all cumulative and at the end of the year you'll have you know, X amount less body fat. And he wrote an article about it in a science magazine that was devoted to this topic, at the end of which he said, it remains to be empirically tested. What does that mean? That means he doesn't have the evidence. It's like, okay, it makes sense. It's, it, it, it's so intuitive that we've got to do it. But uh, by the way, I don't actually have evidence that it works. And then later, in, uh, a few years later, uh, American Heart Association in their guidelines for ac activity also say, so far data to support this hypothesis are not particularly compelling. But we want you to do it anyway because we think it's the solution to the problem, okay? So this is the state of of the evidence and, and, and more recently studies, big studies have looked at this and concluded that exercise is not the answer. Westertrip in a paper in 2010 actually figured it out and said an exercise induced increase in energy requirement, in other words uh, you exercise and burn off calories, typically comp is compensated by an increased energy intake. So you work up an appetite and you eat more. Okay? That, uh, over, but, but here's the Nobel Prize winning uh, science. Overeating does not affect physical activity, while undereating decreases habitual or voluntary physical activity. So in other words, if you exercise, you eat more, but if you eat more, it doesn't make you exercise. <laughs> who, wouldn't, who knew, eh? Um, <laughs> and then, having figured this out, essentially, he concludes there are two ways in which the general population trend towards uh, being overweight can be reversed reduce intake or increase physical activity. What? <laughs> WTF? <you know? laughs> Which, by the way, means where's the fat? <laughs> Which is my next topic. Um, so let's look at fat because everybody knows that if you want to lose weight, you've got to stop eating fat, right? Because fat has nine, grams of cal uh, nine calories per gram. The other foods have four, so fat's the culprit when you get fat. Well, Walter Willett, one of the leading nutritional epidemiologists in the world based at Harvard, uh, did a, an analysis of all the literature a few years ago on this. And he looked at studies all around the world and he figured out that there was no relationship between the, how much fat a population ate and their obesity rates. There was no relationship. And the, the, ra the variation in fat was 25 to 47%. So quite a, quite a range in the different studies. And in Europe, ladies pay attention. In Europe, there was actually an inverse relationship. Those, those French, those skinny French women were the ones that were eating the most brie and butter. So he concludes, diets high in fat are not the primary cause of excess body fat. Uh, reductions in dietary, nor are reductions in dietary fat a solution. And he goes on to say, exercise is the answer. <laughs> Whoa, so close, he got so close. Here's some raw data from your Department of Agriculture. This is raw, unmanipulated data about the food supply, and we're looking at grams of nutrient per capita. And we're looking at this line here, which is fat in the American food supply. And that's the year at which that the obesity epidemic takes off. Do you see a change in fat in your food supply? No, there's no change. Saturated fat, no change. Now, saturated fat's important because it's not just about weight. It's that nasty fat that clogs your arteries, right? Like that cold bacon fat going down the kitchen drain pipe. It you eat that and it clogs your arteries. 
and gives you a heart attack. And that's why we're not supposed to eat saturated fat. It's not about your weight. Well, it turns out that that's uh, what we call in the medical world bull. Uh, because there's been some big studies now. The, it turns out the original science that convinced people that was the case was very shaky science. And now there's been some well-conducted studies. And this is a, a meta-analysis, which is kind of the best kind of study. They took 21 large epidemiological studies, ranging in length from 5 to 23 years. So big data pool. They pooled all the, the data from there. They had 350,000 subjects. And what they looked at was the relationship between their saturated fat consumption and any risk of cardiovascular disease or stroke. And they found no relationship. Okay, pretty convincing. Krauss, Ron Krauss is a lipidologist based in San Francisco, not so far away, kind of summed it up. Because this, this is an observational study. And observational studies don't give you definitive conclusions. They give you hypotheses, associations. It doesn't say one thing causes another. You have to do the clinical trial to get that. The problem with nutritional research is we rely on this kind of data without doing the clinical trials. And that's why we get it wrong so often. But in this case, we are fortunate because the clinical trial was done. It was called the Women's Health Initiative. You spent almost as much money on that trial as it took to put a man on the moon. And here's what you got. After eight, eight, over eight years of intense behavioral intervention to reduce fat intake, uh, there was no reduction in coronary heart disease, stroke, or cardiovascular disease in the, the subjects of the study. So they came up with nothing. Krauss is the one who's leading the research on which of the cholesterols is the really bad cholesterol. I mentioned it earlier, the small, dense LDL. You know LDL is bad cholesterol, right? But if you had zero LDL, you'd be dead. It's a normal part of your physiology. You need LDL. It's a question of the, the, the quality of the LDL, and it's measured in particle size. So the small, dense particle size LDL is the one that's uh, very closely associated with cardiovascular disease. And so Krauss was looking at what causes small, dense LDL. And he's looking at four different LDL fractions here. This is the, the healthy LDL, and this is the small dense, and these are the intermediate ones. And this is the baseline. People are on a diet with 54% carbohydrate. So that's pretty kind of an average diet. Then he reduces it to 9%. That's not a big reduction. It's not a, what I would call a low-carb diet. But he gets a shift in the LDL in the direction of healthier LDL. The bad LDL goes down. The good LDL goes up. So he reduces it to 26%. And look, he gets a dramatic shift. That's, he's only cut it in half. It's not what a, I would call a really low carb diet, but look at the improvement in LDL. And then what he does is he maintains that 26% carbohydrate and he swaps saturated fat into the diet for the other fats. So he's replaced the other fats with saturated fat, the one that was supposed to clog your arteries and cause heart disease, and he gets a bigger improvement when he increases the saturated fat. So in, in these studies, he's showing that not only is saturated fat not implicated in the harm of this bad LDL, carbohydrates are, saturated fat is actually part of the solution in improving the health of your LDL. Protein. So we've got three macronutrients, fat, protein, and carbohydrate. Did protein cause the uh, epidemic? No. That's the protein level there, the blue line. It's been pretty constant. So that leaves the other macronutrient. And sure enough, that's the one that's increased in the American food supply in sync with the increasing obesity epidemic. So eating too much and exercising too little makes you fat, right? We still, uh, some of you might still think that's true. These are my before and after photos. <laughs> So that's how we explain this guy's additional dimension here compared to this guy. This guy ate more and exercised less. Or this guy ate less and exercised more. And that's our explanation for the difference here. Does eating too much and exercising too little make you tall? How do we explain these guys? They've got a dimensional difference in the other axis, right? Which one eats more? It's not a trick question. This guy ate more. Is that why he's so darn tall? 
This guy ate less, is that why he's so small? Of course not. We, we would never, never assume that. He had to eat more. Something made him eat more to get so darn tall. What made him eat more was a, a hormonal disruption. In this case, a problem with growth hormone and vice versa for the little guy. So let's look at hormones and their potential interaction with the, other, the growth in the other dimension, the, fat, the growth around the middle. Let's talk about insulin. That's the primary one. Uh, Eric already showed you this and spoiled my surprise. Uh, that, that in your blood, in your entire blood supply, this is how much blood sugar you have. It's not a very big amount. And that if you have that much more over time, it does severe harm. That's what happens to diabetics. So your body knows that this has to be kept within a certain range. That if it gets out of that range over any length of time, it's very harmful to you. It's very toxic to you. Okay? So when you eat, you know, you drink, uh, eat a big pasta meal and drink a glass of juice and have a sugary dessert and have, you know, 50 or 60 teaspoons of sugar being quickly digested and absorbed into your bloodstream, you, what you have done when you do that is you create a metabolic emergency. Your body has to scramble to get rid of all that sugar that's rapidly entering the bloodstream. How does it do it? It pumps out a ton of insulin and insulin goes to work. And what insulin's job is is to protect you from that excess toxic blood sugar. First thing it does is it opens the doors to the cell and it pushes the sugar in to be burned. That's one way of getting rid of it. Okay? It blocks other fuels from being burned, like fat. In the liver, the insulin goes to work and Gets, whips the liver into turning excess blood sugar into fat. And then that fat flows out of the liver into the bloodstream and insulin's at the door of the fat cell, pushing that fat into the fat cell and keeping it in there, getting it out of the way of the process of burning. So all those things are going on when you eat a high carb meal. Your body's desperately trying to control your blood sugar and insulin's doing everything it can to neutralize the effect of that toxic uh, glucose. When the conventional people look at this, they say, oh, look, the cells are burning glucose in front of everything else. It must be because they like glucose, right? You're told that glucose is essential for energy. The body loves to burn it. Well, what I'm telling you is the body's burning it all right because it's desperate to get rid of it. And that's one of the ways it does, and it pays a price for doing that. It pays a price. You end up with a fatty liver from all that uh, sugar being turned into fat in the liver. You end up with overweight because of the insulin effect on the adipose tissue, storing the fat, not letting it back out of the fat cells. And you develop insulin resistance in the cells who say, I'm sick and tired of burning this toxic crap. I'm going to try and stop it from coming in the cell. And you have a fight between insulin and insulin resistance. Okay? But the conventional view is it's because you like it. Okay, that was my rant about insulin and, and sugar. When you develop insulin resistance, you have to increase the amount of insulin to keep your blood sugar normal. And insulin causes fat to get stored and stay stored. So one of the first signs of insulin resistance is the sudden gaining of weight. Something that you go along in your life and then suddenly at some point you start to gain weight. And several years later you might have a blood sugar problem. Now, when you gain weight, another hormone is at work. Leptin. Leptin is a signaling hormone. It does a number of things, but main function of leptin is when your fat tissue is expanding, it sends a leptin molecule up to your brain to tell you to stop eating. So it's a simple feedback. When the bathtub is filling up, you want to turn off the water. And leptin goes to the brain and says, fat tissue is expanding, you can stop eating. We've got excess energy coming on board. So these people with insulin resistance, their fat tissue is expanding. You would expect them to be sending a big leptin signal to the brain. And they do. But what happens? Those people don't stop eating. They're hungry all the time. They, they, they keep eating. So something has gone wrong. And uh, uh, Robert Lustig, who you probably know, he's fairly famous from his YouTube sugar videos and stuff, has done work on this. And he believes that insulin functions as a leptin antagonist. So that high insulin level that's causing you to gain weight and expand your fat tissue, resulting in a high leptin signal going to the brain, 
the high insulin actually cuts the leptin off at the pass. It doesn't get to the brain. And when the brain doesn't get a leptin signal, the brain interprets that to mean that you're starving, the opposite of what's actually happening. And animals, when they starve, they do two things. They conserve energy and they seek food. So that very overweight, pre-diabetic person sitting on the sofa who does nothing all day but watch Oprah, and the only exercise they get is the frequent trips to the kitchen, is actually following that internal, that powerful internal survival mechanism that's coming out of their brain that thinks they're starving. Okay, and our, what's our prescription for that person? Get your sorry butt off the sofa and go jogging and stay away from the fridge. And some people can do that, but most people have a very difficult time overpowering what is a, a basic survival signal telling them to do the exact opposite. So that's why I think we failed. We got the original premise wrong. We didn't understand what was actually causing this, and we gave the wrong prescription. The right prescription is to fix that hormonal uh, problem. <clears throat> so here's our original idea. It's just the increased calories, decreased activity make you fat. It turns out that it's actually fat that makes you increase, keep eating more, and reduce your activity, and that the thing that makes you fat is that metabolic dysregulation of insulin and leptin, and the thing that's driving that is carbohydrates in your diet. So with this different paradigm of what's causing the problem, we go to the root of the problem and we say, okay, let's take dietary carbohydrates off the table. Stop eating the carbohydrates and see if this, we unravel this dysfunction. And it turns out that we do. That all the studies show the same thing. And you've seen some of the studies already. Here's a couple that uh, researchers in Minnesota that I love, these old, couple old researchers who've been fooling around with what they call low bag diets. That means low biologically available glucose. Uh, in some places, you're not supposed to say low carb or you don't get funded, okay? These are low carb diets. And what they did was they took newly diagnosed diabetics and they put them on varying diets with lower and lower carbs. So 40, 40%, 30%, 20% of calories is carbohydrate. And look what happens to the hemoglobin A1C. It goes down in sync with the reduction in carbohydrates. And what they did was they did a comparison of the results they get at five weeks and 15 weeks in terms of lowering hemoglobin A1C compared to the reductions you get from medications. Far and away greater reduction just by taking carbohydrates out of the diet instead of taking the medication. Here's a f study by some very, well, one very famous and highly esteemed researcher and another guy, another guy I don't like very much. Uh, this is comparing uh, low GI uh, with a regular diet those first two bars on weight, hemoglobin A1C, glucose, lipids. And then some smart aleck comes along and compares low carb with low GI, and these two bars, and gets a much better result with low carb than with low GI. Okay? And look at, look at the difference in triglycerides, huge difference, but much better improvements in hemoglobin A1C and so on. But this guy, Jenkins, he's the inventor of the glycemic index concept. He's at the University of Toronto. He's a big vegan, you know, advocate. Um, he gets cited and he's, he's uh, cited in the diabetes guidelines and they, they validate a low glycemic diet based on this, his studies. Ignoring the studies of my colleague here, Westman, who showed that low carb's even better. So it's a, it's a crazy world out there. So, studies of low-carb diet, when they're done well, and there's lots of them that aren't, and, and the irony, of course, is the ones that aren't done well tend to get the headlines. The ones that are done well by people like Westman and Volek and Finney uh, find that people who go on low-carb lose a lot of weight, correct their insulin and leptin resistance, normalize their blood sugar, normalize blood pressure, normalize their lipids, and reduce inflammation. So what's not to like about that? Now, we're going to go these, through these in detail. The, these are actually assembled by the Atkins people. Uh, they put together a, a table, some tables of summarizing low-carb diets. And we'll just quickly scroll through, just in case you thought there was no science behind this. <laughs> these are the studies that back, back this up. So there's quite a few studies out there. That's the point. Now, 
I'll, I'll mention that other things seem to be getting better when you stop eating carbs as well. I have a woman who had severe Crohn's disease for 12 years, went in complete remission with low carb, eventually got scoped, completely normal gut. She was in tears. Uh, hemochromatosis. We found that people with hemochromatosis, when they go on low carb, their ferritin levels come down and they, they uh, don't need to be bled. They don't need to be phlebotomized. Migraine. Some people respond really well to this diet. Chronic, severe migraines go away. Milroy syndrome, particular, of particular interest to the sponsors here, is, a, is an idiopathic a lymphedema problem. And uh, we had a guy in one of our studies who had severe lymphedema in his legs to the extent that he wouldn't be seen in public in short pants. They were very swollen. And he, he didn't have a lot of weight to lose, but he signed up on our study and his, lymph, his lymphedema, lymphedema went away. It, it corrected his lymphedema. Uh, schizophrenia, Eric published a, a letter on a, on a patient with schizophrenia where it was corrected with low carb. And there's some literature now pointing to mood disorders, anxiety disorders, bipolar, and depression would benefit from a ketogenic diet. Um, this was in Psychology Today a couple months ago. A young uh, physician on staff at Harvard who published a, an article called Your Brain on Ketones, in which he details all the benefits to the neurons when they're burning ketones as a fuel instead of that toxic glucose that we're supposed to be burning. You can Google that. If you Google Your Brain on Ketones, you'll find her article, and it's worth reading. Reversal of diabetic nephropathy by a ketogenic diet. There's some interesting data coming out now that early kidney damage which was always thought to be irreversible in the conventional approach to things, is now, there are studies showing that you can actually reverse that on a ketogenic diet. <coughs> Here's another uh, a case report showing that. Uh, this was in the British Medical Journal just a couple months ago. Uh, uh, a cardiologist in England writing that saturated fat is not the major issue. So reviewing some of the things I just told you, saying that we basically got it wrong with saturated fat. So some of these things are starting to get uh, uh, into the mainstream of medical literature. So how's my time? You got four minutes. Four minutes? <laughs> I'm better than Westman, eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, so increasing evidence that low-carb ketogenic diets are effective for the treatment of obesity metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes. Does everybody, everybody know Occam's razor? Occam's razor is this philosophical idea that the simplest answer is most likely to be the correct answer. 20 different classes of drugs to treat these or one dietary change. Which do you think is the correct answer? Physiological mechanisms have been described so we're starting to understand what at the nuts and bolts level is going on to, to, to make this happen. I didn't talk about fructose, but it looks like the fructose component of the sugar molecule is perhaps more important here that drives some of these problems. Um, we get a lot of confusion, particularly in the public mind, because headlines are, there's a lot of studies showing this, that, and the other thing. And you have to really d dive in and look carefully at what was done in these studies to understand the results. And you don't get that from reading about it in newspapers and magazines. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of moneyed interests out there that don't really want you to go on a low-carb diet. Think of all the money you save on drugs when you get off all your diabetes meds and your antihypertensives and your statins. Well, somebody's losing money <laughs> when you're not spending it on drugs. Uh, Food, the food sector. There are big interests in the food sector that don't want you to stop eating potatoes and drinking juice and stop eating pasta and so on and so forth. So there are people out there whose agenda is to confuse you about this. And that's why I think it's very difficult for you and the public. Um, there are a lot of critics who say that uh, reducing carbohydrates means you have to increase fat and that fat is linked to cardiovascular disease even though the evidence now is showing us that's not the case. Uh, and they, they cite lack of clear definitions, exactly what is a low carb diet. Paucity of evidence, compliance, well nobody can stay on that diet, right? I've only been doing it 11 years. Um, possible adverse effects and the need for more studies. You know, there's always a need, before you can actually do anything, you need to study it more. 
Well, we're making progress. The American Diabetes Association has included this as a valid weight loss diet for a number of years now. Norway includes it in their guidelines. Uh, the Swedish Ministry of Health did an investigation. They were, there was a doctor very publicly talking about it and they, she got, they complained about her so they had to do an investigation and it validated the diet uh, at the, the government level in Sweden. So that had a big impact in Sweden where now about a quarter of the population is restricting carbs. The Swedish Health Technology Council recently reviewed weight loss diets and came out in favor of this diet. And we find it now being promoted by several widely read diet books. <laughs> These books, this, this is the one I, I like uh, because the authors are friends of mine. Uh, <laughs> And then these books have come out recently and are becoming very popular. And I, I, I've been recommending this one to people and they come back to me and they're very committed to low carb diet after reading that book. Uh, Eric gave me this slide. You went on Atkins and lost 90 pounds, lowered your cholesterol, cured your high blood pressure, and now you're walking five miles a day, but I'm warning you, a low carb diet is bad for your health. <laughs> you still hear that from people who should know better. But in fairness to my colleagues, the medical doctors, they don't get taught this stuff. I, I speak at conferences, I teach in the med school, but I'm, I'm just a drop in the ocean. They, this is not uh, taught in medical curriculums. And this is probably the biggest part of our problem here. All these corporations, the, the, these group of corporations control all these brands, and if you look, you can't really see it very well here, but if you look, it's all sugar and starch. And that's where I should be today with my, my son. <laughs> That, that's my young son, who's a very good skier. Yeah. Thank you. Brands, and if you look, you can't really see it very well here, but if you look.